the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Not too many weeks ago, a friend of mine, a member of our Thursday morning group, asked me the following question, or two questions, actually. He said, why don't preachers title their sermons? Well, one of my great fears is titling sermons, and I'm so glad I'm not in one of those free churches where the, you have to put the catchy title out every week. The one I will never forget, will forget from Kentucky was one I saw in Murray, Kentucky one time, with the title of the sermon is Jesus the Lily of Your Valley. Ah, uh, can't make it up. So I'm also a little nervous about sermon titles. However, my friend made a request, and so this sermon has a title. It's also going to be delivered from a pulpit. He asked, why all these preachers preach from the aisle? Well, I preach from the aisle every week, but for a challenge, I'm preaching from the pulpit today. The title of the sermon is this, Anxiety, Hospitality's Enemy. The title of the sermon is this, Anxiety, Hospitality's Enemy. And the text for the sermon are these words. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Distraction, worry, Anxiety is the enemy of hospitality. In 1939, a vessel named the USS St. Louis arrived in Cuba. Most of the passengers on that vessel were Jews fleeing Europe. They were fleeing the horror of European life after Kristallnacht in 1938. The plan was to get to Cuba, to get a visa in Cuba, and then from Cuba await admission to the United States. Cuba, so afraid of powerful Germany, would not even let them off the vessel. One man, so desperate for a chance at life, slit his wrists and jumped into the sea. He was rescued, taken to a hospital in Cuba, and he was the only Jew admitted. Appeals went out and cables were sent to the State Department, even to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the response was, we cannot accept these refugees. An appeal was further issued to Canada, whose prime minister said famously, we cannot accept in this country every refugee from Europe. Over half of the passengers on that ill-fated vessel perished in the Holocaust because they returned to Europe as they were forced to do. Anxiety is the enemy of hospitality. Our nation apologized for that refusal in the year 2012. The apology did nothing, of course, for those who perished. It was only good for our own corporate soul. Hospitality, whose enemy is anxiety, can be a matter of life and death. It's not just something that's kind of fun and southern fried, like chicken. It's a matter of life and death. Sometimes that's literally true, and sometimes I think that's emotionally true, particularly for those of us who have the grace 
And we all have the grace. And for those of us who have the curse of being in families, they're both. The hospitality that Abraham and Sarah extended to the strangers was a survival strategy. Now, I wish we could all really feel this story from Genesis because it's really quite funny in many ways. Abraham and Zerah live in a nomadic culture. There is no police force. There's no king. There's no government. And gosh knows there's no cell phone with 911. And suddenly, in the, med- in the middle of nowhere, three powerful, unknown men are suddenly at the tent flap. And so what does Abraham do? Well, he's crafty. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Come on, your feet must be tired and hot. Let me wash them for you. Now, to, you know, just a morsel of bread, you know, to tide you over. Please, come on, have a little bite to eat. But then what he says to his wife is, quick, the best flour, make some bread. Quick, by the way, some lamb stew would be good. Quick, we don't know who these people are. We don't know what they're intended. But we do know that it's hard to kill somebody who's just given you a good meal. <laughs> Quick, hospitality could be a matter of our life or our death. In a nomadic culture where no police, no army, no king, And so she gets to work. They have a lovely luncheon. It's great. And then, somehow, in God's miraculous seeing, the visitors, which Abraham and Sarah wrongly perceived to be potential enemies, the visitors, the stranger actually articulates the deep, almost unspoken but consuming hope of their hearts, you will have a son. It's the stranger who brings them the gospel. It's the stranger who has pierced to their very deepest and unfulfilled longing. And then if you had read a little further in the Old Testament, in this wonderful story, Those of you who have been to Sunday school once upon a time might remember that what was Sarah's response. Good old post-menopausal, hopeless Sarah in the tent goes, ha, ha, ha! And a year later, Isaac, the son of laughter, is their deepest longing fleshed out. The longing promised by the dangerous stranger who is actually God masquerading as the stranger, welcoming a welcome. It's a powerful story. And it should, dis- it should define us. But I, you know, and sometimes we are fortunate and we do offer hospitality and in the doing of hospitality, we do find blessing. But I think there is a somewhat obscured but essential point in the story about Mary and Martha. I think we should also notice this. True hospitality can be very hard to achieve (laughs) sometimes with those nearest and dearest and closest to us. Mama always loved you more. Martha's Martha's anxiety, remember, anxiety is the enemy of hospitality. Martha's anxiety caused her to be blinded, blinded to the Lord's view of her sister. Mary was seated at the Lord's feet in rapt attention. That is so countercultural. We miss that. We don't understand that what has happened is that the Lord Jesus Christ, the rabbi from northern Galilee, will admit women into rabbinical study. 
The position at the feet of a rabbi means that the person at the rabbi's feet has been accepted to study Torah, is worthy of studying Torah, is worthy to know the very things of God for herself, her own glorious and beautiful self made in God's image. Mary has been seen through Jesus' eyes as the intelligent, gifted, holy person that she is. And because of her status as a rabbinical student, she is learning the better things of God and God's way. And she has missed. She has missed. Martha has missed seeing Mary as the rabbinical student as the theologian, as the God-knower that she is. Rabbis, when they have students at their feet, ask questions. A rabbi once asked his students a question. And the question was this. When do we know when night ends and day begins? One student said, when we hear the first bird sing. Another student said, when there is enough light to tell the difference between a dog and a goat. The rabbi said, no. You don't understand. Night ends when you look into the face of another person and see the face of God. Night ends when you look into the face of another person and you see the face of God. Rabbi Jesus looked in Mary's face and he actually saw her. He saw her desire for God. He saw her mind. He saw her devotion. He saw her longing. And despite the cultural prohibition, he accepted her as a student of Torah at his feet. Martha looked into her sister's face and saw a breach of hospitality and a betrayal of the moment. But don't miss Jesus' response. If you're going to listen to anything I say to you this morning, please, please, I beg you, do not miss Jesus' response. Martha, Martha, This is a double naming, a deliberate double naming. Martha, I love you. Martha, I name and I rename you just to remind you just how much I cherish you. I know you, Martha, and I rename you the Martha you can't even imagine yourself to be. I cherish you. I cherish your friendship. I cherish your very life. You too desire a place at my feet. You too are worthy of a place at my feet because you enjoy a place in my heart. Your welcome, your love, your very self is so much more important to me than a pot of lamb stew. Martha, Martha, come home, dear one, to the God's eye view of yourself. Come home, Martha. Enjoy your double name. Martha, 
have a new dawning of self, a new dawning of how loved you are. Let the night of your anxiety dawn. Wake up. Nightmare's over. You're so cherished. St. James Church is part of the one church of Jesus whose job it is to represent into our world, into our now, capital N, the transforming hospitality of Jesus Christ. We are trusted by God to a world that as we look around seems sometimes quite dark. It seems quite distracted. It seems increasingly groping and desperate for the nightmare to be over. We live in a world that is anxious. And in that anxiety, rather than seeing God's face in the visitor, we see enemy. Even as we're looking at a three-year-old, And we live in that world, this world. On a hot Sunday morning in July, we, came, we come to this table and this meal. And we're going to eat his body bread and we're going to drink his costly chalice and he will whisper your name. It's not Martha, Martha, but Ted, Ted, or... Jane, Jane, or Sam, Sam, or Marie, Marie, or Alan, Alan, and suddenly, and suddenly, even at this altar, we are changed. And we look at this congregation out here before us, and we leave, and we look at our neighbors, and in it, as we look upon them, dawn, it dawns on us, literally, it dawns on us that every human being bears the face of God because she is known by name. And that we, the church, the benefits of such costly, life-changing, name-identifying hospitality are trusted with renaming this world. To say over and over again to every human being we meet, their cherished status as chosen and beloved and blessed. And so, when does night and day begin? 